Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Bob Berg. Just to tell you a little bit about Bob, Bob is a sought-after speaker at corporate conventions and for entrepreneurial events. He's addressed audiences ranging in size from 50 to 16,000. Shared the platform with notables including today's top thought leaders, broadcast personalities, Olympic athletes, political leaders, including a former United States president. Although for years he was best known for his book, Endless Referrals, over the past few years, it's his book, The Go-Giver, which was co-authored with John David Mann, that's captured the imagination of his readers. I have to say, I listen to it once a year. It's shot, it is shot to the number six on the Wall Street Journal's business bestsellers list just three weeks after its release, reached number nine on Business Week. It's been translated into 21 languages. It's his fourth book to sell over 250,000 copies. That's amazing. Bob's an advocate, supporter, and defender of the free enterprise system, believing that the amount of money one makes is directly proportional to how many people they serve. Bob, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Jeremy. Great to be here with you. I like to include one fun fact so people get to know you a little bit better. And from what you said, which I would not have guessed, is Bob's an introvert when he's not speaking on the road, right? Um, Bob, so we'll talk about how do we start with a big idea like being a go-giver, going to spreading the word to millions of people through books and speaking like you do. I'm really looking forward to hearing more very, about very, very much so. Yeah. Uh, and, and I always was... Go ahead. I think we have a little bit of a delay, so so go ahead. Okay, Jeremy, and, and I apologize. I I think when I was speaking before, I don't think you heard me, and then I didn't hear you when you were speaking. Go ahead. I think there was a delay for a second, but it looks like it caught up. Okay, so so where are we? <laughs> um, basically, in your teachings, you really break some paradigms about sales. So I wanted to hear about some of those. Well, yeah, one of the things, John David Mann, my excellent co-author uh, of the Go-Giver series, that we wanted to do was uh, was sort of set a, a more um, accurate premise, I guess you could say, regarding what sales is and what it isn't. Because so many people, Jeremy, have a, a misconception and misperceptions about what selling is. So we thought we'd go with kind of what it isn't as well as what it is. And a lot of people think that that selling is about trying to convince someone to buy something they, they don't want or need, when in actuality, selling is just the opposite. It's, it's finding out what someone does want or need and, and helping them to get it. Uh, people think selling is about taking advantage of others. It's just the opposite. It's about bringing people more advantage through your product or service, should they have the need, want, and desire for it. Uh, but probably the biggest misperception of all is that at its heart, uh, selling is about taking. And it's not. Again, just the opposite. Selling at its core, at its highest, at its most profitable is all about giving. And I mean that literally. Now, someone say, well, what do you mean that literally? You mean, you mean that figuratively? No, I mean it literally because the old English root of the word sell is salan, which meant to, to give. So when you're selling, literally, you're giving. Now, someone might say, well, okay, I, I get that, but that's kind of a trick. I mean, really, when you're selling, what are you really giving? Well, I would ask that question. Let's say you're in a sales presentation. You have a prospect in front of you. You are, you are in the selling context. What are you giving? I suggest you're giving time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, and most of all, value. So if you are a professional salesperson and that's what you're doing, you should be very proud of what you're doing and to call yourself a salesperson. Uh, unfortunately, you've got so many salespeople who just, they have that those same misperceptions about selling and that's why you hear them say things like, well, yeah, I, I, I'm in selling, but I don't really sell, I just help people. Well, the basic premise is that by selling, you're not helping people. Now, here's the problem with that, Jeremy. If you're in sales, and if you're in business, you're in sales, and yet you don't really believe in selling as a legitimate profession to the point that you try to deny that you're a salesperson, there's a disconnect there that's going to hurt your production, and it's going to keep people who could benefit from your product or service from utilizing your product or service, because you're not going to allow yourself to succeed 
at something you don't believe is right. So I want people, and I wrote a blog post on this, I called it Embrace Your Inner Salesperson. Don't say things like sell without selling or things like that. No, selling, if you believe it is a righteous thing, is what you want to do. What people mean is don't be a pushy person or don't be a con artist. But that's a whole lot different from selling, which is a wonderful profession and which is the engine with entrepreneurship that drives a free market-based economy. Yeah. And I want people to know what's possible for them because I definitely, after listening to The Go-Giver every year, I incorporate it in my life. I wanted to see what example you have of someone that you know of before using The Go-Giver way and then how they transformed after applying uh, that go-giver mentality? Well, there are many examples that we hear from people, but the examples came later than we thought. And, and here's what I mean. When the book first came out, and it really got off <coughs> excuse me, uh, to a good start, and of course John, my co-author, and I were very happy about that, what we found out was that the people who were the early adopters, if you will, to to uh, take a Malcolm Gladwell quote, the early adopters weren't the people who needed the information on the go-giver. These were the people who were already uh, living their lives and conducting their business that way. These were the leaders that were very successful, the salespeople that were hugely successful, and they would get the book and it, it sort of just said to them, wow, yeah, this is what I do. This is what I've been telling people. So they were getting the book and sharing it with others and telling others about it and that's how it began to spread. We had companies that before they had me come in to, to speak, they'd buy a hundred copies or they'd buy a thousand copies. One company bought 15,000 copies. Wow. Uh, they just, but it was what they were already doing. They didn't learn anything from the book. It just told them what they were already doing. Then what happened was the people who started getting the book based on, on, you know, being, having it referred to them or however they found out about it, they started making those chips. They started writing us. And we used some of those stories, by the way, in Go Givers Sell More, the follow up book to the Go Giver. And it was just such a great thing to see that someone would say, well, yeah, while well, I was so focused on myself, business was always a struggle. And, you know, sometimes it was profitable and other times it wasn't. And it was always a fight. Well, once they started shifting their focus onto the most important part of the process, the prospect, the customer, the client, and began utilizing the five laws, now all of a sudden their business was a lot more fun, a lot less stressful, and absolutely a lot more profitable. So so we just so appreciated the people who were already doing that long before they heard of the book, passing that book along to others. I see, yeah. And so people, I wanted to hear... Um, you know, what was the time when you were growing up that influenced you to think this way? Because I'm sure it's, you know, up until now, it's ingrained in you. I wanted to see what influenced you early on when you were younger. Well, I was very lucky to have parents who embodied this. I mean, they, they both grew up very poor, especially my dad, uh, but very entrepreneurial, and they were they lived their lives by providing value to others, both personally and in business. So it was an example I always saw, though I wouldn't have put it together with a term like the go-giver or understood that it was a, a good business practice and life practice. I you just as a kid, you don't think of it, but you learn by you live by example. Uh, at the same time, I certainly had my rebellious phase, and in, and in, in also in terms of how, you know how business was really done and so forth and so. But I came back to what my basic values were and what I had been taught. So for me, it became very natural that once I understood and started to study sales and began to learn the skills of sales, and once I began to, to read books like Think and Grow Rich and How to Win Friends and Influence People and Psycho-Cybernetics and all these great books, and I could take all of that great information and then put it back to my upbringing and having parents who embodied exactly what we're talking, then I could put it together, and that's really what happened. Yeah. I mean, sometimes in hard times, it feels almost counterintuitive, um, you know, to be a go-giver. And I love that example from your book about the lady who was unemployed. Heather, yeah. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about that lady and what she did? Well, it, she she was in a middle or sort of upper middle management job that she thought was was pretty secure, and it turned out it, it wasn't. And so she got involved in a small group of people who got together to to uh, to find a job, basically. 
and there was a big focus on themselves. Everyone was focused on themselves and how. But what happened was, and, and is, what happened was, basically, they sort of came together and. and, and the, Heather had read the book and, and said, uh, you know what, instead of focusing on how to find jobs for ourselves, let's instead focus on how we can help each other find jobs. In other words, they shifted their focus from themselves, they, sh they shifted from an I focus or a me focus to an other focus. And what happened is now you had this hugely expanded pie, and all of a sudden people are getting jobs left and right. Well now people, more people are coming into their group, they're learning this philosophy, and they're doing the same thing, and it was very successful for them. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people, too, are out there, and maybe they're trying to struggle to find their mission or their voice like you have. Do you remember that time that was like a light bulb moment for you, and you knew the go-giver was something you need to get out to the world? Oh, gosh. You know, that's a great question, Jeremy, and I'm not sure if there was necessary, uh, necessarily a one light bulb moment mm -hmm. as much as it was sort of that I, I grew into it. Uh, I was teaching networking in terms of cultivating relationships, benefit, mutually beneficial win-win relationships in which people could, could, um, could increase their business through doing this and, uh, and, and really, Endless Referrals, which was my first book, which is, that's what it was about, uh, business networking, is really the how-to aspect of the go-giver. Um, but what happened was, I, I always loved business, and, and Endless Referrals was a how-to book. And I, I always loved reading parables, business fables, uh, starting with Og Mandino's Greatest Salesman in the World, you know, those books, yeah. Richest Man in Babylon by Klassen. And then in the 80s, there came that short, that sort of shorter parable, uh, Blanchard and Johnson's One Minute Manager, Johnson's One Minute Salesperson, Johnson's Who Moved My Cheese, friends like Robin Sharma, Chris Widener, uh, all, all these different people were coming up with these parables. I thought, great. Uh, you know, you could, you could read them in an hour, hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half, and have fun, and take these great lessons. And, uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to put endless referrals into parable form? And, and I thought about it, and I, I came up with the basic theme and the title of The Go-Giver. But here, here's the thing, Jeremy. I sat down to write the book, and it took me all about, of about one minute to realize there's a big difference between writing a how-to book, which is simply putting down what you know, and writing a fictional story. Now, I can tell a story from stage, but it's always when something really has happened. There's a big difference in that and actually creating a story. So I knew it was outside, not just outside my comfort zone. I can live outside my comfort zone. I think we all do that as a matter of course. But it was, as, jo as Dr. John Maxwell would say, it was outside my strength zone. I see. And I knew I could not do justice to this story. So I asked my friend John David Mann, who I'd never met in person at that time, but he was my, my co-op, my, um, editor in chief of a magazine I used to write for, and he always did such a great job editing my monthly stories, uh, articles. Uh, our running joke was, you know, he's such a nice guy, he's brilliant, but he's very humble, so he'd always write back and say, you know, I fix this, I change that, is this okay? And our running joke became, I'd write back and say, John, not only is it okay, you write my stuff better than I write my stuff. <laughs> so I asked John, he was the only one I wanted to write this with me, and, I, and he was the lead writer and storyteller, believe me, it's John's great writing that made the characters come to lot to life. But once this was developing, the story, I saw this was kind of it. I, I knew, I, I just knew this was going to, and again, I credit John's great writing, I knew this was going to make a huge impact. Now, I think the go-giver itself, rather than being my life mission, is one kind of one part of my life's mission, and, and let me just explain real quickly. Yeah. And I might be o the only one who finds this interesting, so I'm giving you a warning. <laughs> but, but, you know, my dad has always had, to this day, and he's 89 years old, to this day, he has always had this terrific way of bringing out the best in people. He does what I call making people genuinely feel good about themselves. Okay? He's always done that, and I've always tried to... Uh, I emulate that. that. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's really my mission. I think if there's a reason I was brought here, it's to help people genuinely feel better about themselves. But yeah. now I think the go-giver goes some of the way to do that, and that's the way I guess I express that and, and try to bring that. Uh, but really, that's part of what I think is even a, a little bit of a, a greater 
mission to do that. Yeah, I mean, because I remember listening to Endless Referrals, and it does have all the undertones of the go-giver. I mean, it, it's... And that's why I was asking because yeah. sometimes we're thinking and we're, we're doing certain things, but we don't put it like in that singular mission. And so I guess it takes some collaboration with someone else to kind of bring that to the surface. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's a great point. What was your, what was an example where you saw your dad just kind of make someone feel so good that you remember? Well, I, I actually always remember him doing that, and he had a very he had a very unique type of business because he started by just uh, by opening up a little health club when he was about thirty two, thirty three. He he actually ran after he got out of World War II. He ran the fifth uh, the Fifth Street Gym in Miami Beach, Florida, a very famous fight gym owned by Angelo and Chris Dundee. Angelo Dundee later became the trainer for Muhammad Ali and and. Uh, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and many others. Wow. But back then, this was in the fifties, and this was in Miami, and it was it was beginning to be a pretty big gym. And, and Dad ended up running the the gym. And when he came back up up north, I grew up in Massachusetts, and and, and that's where where Dad grew up. Uh, he was running this gym, and it, it it ended up that he just had a gift. Now, here's a guy who never went to college. I mean, that wasn't even something that you know he had he had gone off to join World War II when he was seventeen, and and they were very poor. That wasn't even college wasn't even a, a something that was thought of. But he was really he was giving boxing lessons, and he was teaching kids physical activity, sports and self defense, and working with families. And he sort of just this was just a gift Dad had. He understood that if you could make a person feel comfortable with themselves physically through sports and self-defense, which were two areas of strength for dad, uh, you could help them to really feel emotionally good about themselves. Hmm. So he actually had families working together physically during the lessons. He'd meet with them as a family. And so my whole life, I basically grew up watching dad, you know, help families better communicate with each other, feel good about themselves, taking kids with a real low self-confidence and, and really help. In fact, Time Magazine did a story on him in 19, I think, 71. Really? It's a, a big thing. So, yeah. So, I, you know, I, again, I had a great example of someone, and, and my mom and dad, just they just celebrated their 56th anniversary a couple of days ago as we're, as we're taping this. And, That's amazing. Uh, so, yeah, so so I I was very fortunate in having a, a great example to to emulate. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. Um, a lot of people out there are teaching and speaking, and you obviously do a phenomenal job of setting yourself apart from everyone else. Um, what's a story or example of how a company chose you to speak because of how you applied the Go Giver way? Hmm. Uh, that's a great question too. I, I would say that. You know, my friend Sean Woodruff, who's a very, very uh, successful entrepreneur up in Michigan, he says that a, a, a good salesperson connects the benefits of his or her product or service with the needs, wants, and desires of the prospect. So I think what it is is when I'm able to position myself to a, a potential, in this case, a speaking client, because that's by and large what I, what I do now, uh, I think they end up seeing that what I'm going to bring to the table, what I am going to, in this case, teach to an audience, is going to, to align with their philosophy and provide the people in their audience, not, not just with a fun, entertaining, and humorous program, but one in which they have the confidence to be able to take that information and begin to apply it immediately. And I think, in a sense, I've positioned myself in the marketplace that way. Uh, that companies have an understanding that that's sort of what I bring to the table with them. Yeah. I mean, do you find that there's advocates within the company that say you need to have Bob, or is it more the um, kind of reaching out, people reach out to them, and then they kind of hear your message through the book? At this point, uh, and really this is, this is really more from, the, from after the Go-Giver came out, now it's it's that somebody in the company got the book at the bookstore or on Amazon.com. They read it. They passed it along. It it went actually up the chain, <laughs> which is sort of the opposite of how you think of things going. And then finally, you know, then we get a call, and well, the, the book has gone through our company. We want to have you come in, and so forth. Much different from what it used to be, even with endless referrals. And that was a very successful book. I use it as a positioning tool and as a marketing and sales tool, but it was still usually outbound. 
and then you know I'd work a, a referral based on my my customers and, and clients. Now with the Go Giver, they tend the calls tend to come to us because the book's been discovered by someone within the company, and as you said, there was a, an advocate within the company. Right. So I wanted to find out to um, maybe a time early on before being a you know before the Go Giver was ingrained that maybe you struggled to apply it to your life or you saw friends struggle to apply it and how they overcame it because I feel like a lot of people are trying to implement it but they fall off the wagon once in a while. Is there an example you can tell us that would um, kind of how they overcame um, how they were before? Well, you know, it's interesting. When you follow the, the principles that are shared in the book, there's nothing self-sacrificial about them. So it's not like you'd fall off the wagon because you're thinking, oh, uh, you know, uh, this can't work because I'm just giving myself away. Because that's not what the, you know, that's, it's not what it, what it's about. So I don't think there's that challenge. But I, I but I, I hear what you're saying, and I think it's just, are we keeping the focus where it's supposed to be? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's on the other person. See. Focusing on the other, and really, what you know, what is the go-giver? The basic uh, premise of the book is, is is simply that shifting one's focus from getting to giving, and when we say giving in this case, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing value to others. But what we understand is that that's not self-sacrificial, because to the in a free market-based economy where you know no one's forced to buy from you. The only reason they're going to buy from you is because they see there being value in the transaction. So to shift your focus and, and focus on that other person, you know, it, that's the most selfish thing you can do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's funny, my friend Adam Grant, who just wrote a, a, a wonderful book called Give and Take, and it's just, it's just starting to make its way around. It's, it, it's already a huge uh, seller. Uh, he cites a study an Australian study of financial advisors, uh, what made them the most successful and in terms of financially? And, of course, part of what was studied was how much knowledge they had of finance, which is very important, how hard they worked, which is also very important. But what trumped all of them was simply that the most successful financial advisors in terms of their income, it was because they put the needs of their client before themselves and before the company. So, you know, it's, and Adam says, you know, it's not, and I love how he says this because he says it better than I do. He says, it's not a matter of being selfless and it's not a matter of being selfish. It's a matter of being other-ish. Other -ish. In other words, your focus is on the others, but it turns out to be the best thing you can do for yourself. So I think when it comes to falling off the wagon, maybe it's that, you know, do we forget that the focus needs to be on others? So I, I, you know, I go back to what you said. I think you're right that that actually can happen for that reason. If we if we forget where we need to keep our focus. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, like I find myself maybe in mid conversation with someone, I'm like, wow, I've been talking way too much about myself. I need to, you know, hear more about them. And at that point, it kind of be I don't know if it's because I've, you know, listened to the Go Giver and some of the other books, <laughs> you know, but it does trigger. It just trigger my mind. Well, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because it, it reminds me, you know, when we write uh, uh, sales copy for a project that we're doing. Now, we know and we teach, have your focus on the others, right? It's not about us. It's not about the features. It, it's about the benefits and how the benefits apply to them. So it's got to be tough. So what's funny is we'll notice when we write a sales letter, and I do the first draft of a sales letter, we go through it the first time. It's so much more about us than it's supposed to be, you know? So we're going through the whole thing, changing it from us, because it's natural. You know, we're excited about the product or service, about the, and how great the thing is. And the, so, but here's the thing. Right. Uh, you make a great point. From being conscious of it, now we're in a position to be able to correct it. Right. But, you know, there's a, there's a very old sales story that, that, you know, most of us learn in our, our first sales class we ever take, and that is, that uh, you know, mi every year, millions and millions and millions of quarter-inch drill bits are bought, and yet not one person buying one of these millions and millions and millions of quarter-inch drill bits actually wants a quarter-inch drill bit. <laughs> what they want is a quarter-inch hole. Right. 
right? The drill bit is simply the medium to help them get what they really want. Now, the drill bit has to be good, it has to work, it has to be guaranteed, it ha you know, what have you, but it's never about the drill bit. Yeah. It's always about the hole and how that person is going to, to use that, that quarter inch hole. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I've gotten out of the books that I use on a daily basis, which is ingrained in me, which actually reminds me of to be a go giver is, um, instead of saying no problem, there's a part of the book where you say, don't say no problem, say it's my pleasure. Pleasure, right. And, and that gives me a daily reminder for me to be a go-giver. Because every time I, I slip up and go, oh, there's no, and I, it's my pleasure. <laughs> so so I appreciate that. Um, it, that was something I actually learned uh, when doing a program years ago for the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Oh, wow. Because, right, when they greet, when the guest contact employees greet a customer, it, first it's never, hi, hey, or how you doing? It's always good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon the time of day. And when you ask them to, you know, show you, you know, where, how do you get to the so-and-so, they'll never just point. They'll always take, they'll drop what they're doing and take you there. When you say thank you, they won't say no problem. They won't even say you're welcome. They'll say my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's, here's what's interesting about that. People might say, oh, well, that's the Ritz Carlton. You know what? To provide that kind of excellence, you don't need to be the Ritz Carlton. Any other hotel, motel, anywhere, could do it. And by the way, some do, but it's just not systemized like the Ritz Carlton. I mean, the Marriott, the, the Hyatt, the, the Westin, all fine properties, they could do it. The Super 8, Super 8 hotels, they could do it. Motel 6, where, where Tom Baudet leaves the lights on for you, they could do it. And Dave and Mary, of Dave and Mary Stop and Stay In, they could do it too, but they usually don't. Now, someone could say, well, oh, well, Bob, okay, that's fine, but you know, Dave and Mary of Dave and Mary's little stop and stay in, they could say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and my pleasure till the cows come home. They're not going to take market share from Ritz Carlton. No, they won't. But what they will do is they will capture much more market share in their targeted demographic, and they'll probably take some market share from Motel 6 and even Super 8. So, you know, it's just those little things we can do to add extra value that doesn't cost a lot of money. It takes some thought and some effort and simply the consciousness to recognize its value, its importance. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Now, I was talking to a bunch of entrepreneurs, and they were really excited to hear what you have to say. And when I told them I was going to talk with you, they go, you know, I want to know a little bit about a day in the life of Bob Berg. Like, what, what's in his routine that makes him successful <laughs> or that makes him productive? Because I'm sure you have a million things going on. What's, what's something in your daily routine that you incorporate? Well, let's see. You know, they, they first of all would be amazed to, to find out how, what most people would consider to be very boring my life is. <laughs> now, I don't find it that way. I find it totally fascinating. Okay. I find life fascinating. I love it. But I don't really, you know, go out and do a whole lot of things. I'm not the most active person in the world. My day start, I, I, I work out first thing in the morning, not because I'm so self-disciplined. I have a trainer who comes in. Her name's Diane. She comes in six days a week to the house. We go outside and do cardio three days. We do strength training inside uh, with some makeshift weights and everything. So, and the only reason I do it is because I pay her to come over and I know I'm accountable. So I'm creating an environment for my success. Right. Okay. Uh, and then I do those things that everybody does, checking the email and doing that. I know people say, well, you should leave that until the afternoon. Well, I don't. Uh, I get the emails out of the way. I check Facebook and Twitter and do all that. So I make sure when I have blog posts to post, I do those, get those out there. I actually do a lot of my social media from about 9 to 9.30. And then I'm usually writing, whether it is a, uh, you know, a week's worth of blog post or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, a new book or whether it's, you know, any project that I'm doing, I, I get to write it. I do probably three or four interviews a day because I'm continually promoting the go giver. Uh, like anything, as much as it's a word of mouth book, I, I still keep the engine running by, uh, consistently doing interviews and other things. So, so I don't, you know, have a, a hugely exciting life as most people would look in and see it, but boy, I, it works for me and I just love it. Yeah, but those details are what are important. It's not the exciting things that we do on a daily basis. It's those things we do consistently. So it's good to know. Right. Um, 
I have one final question for you, Bob, but before I ask it, I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about what you have going on now, about uh, your website, because I think it's really important people check out um, your website, too. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, thank you. My website's Berg.com, B-U-R-G.com. And while they're there, they can subscribe if they'd like to my influence and success insights, which is very value-based information that we send out uh, from time to time. Uh, they can download chapters one of the Go Giver, Go Giver Sell More, Endless Referrals. They can visit my blog if they'd like. Uh, I have about 400 archived articles, audios, videos, all sorts of things. And um, they can connect with me on social media through the uh, through the home page, and we also just did this really cool little four minute and thirty second overview, a whiteboard animated video of the Go Giver that they can check out there as well. So you know, we we invite people to come to Berg.com, B-U-R-G.com, and just hang out for a while and have some fun. No, I love those whiteboard animated videos. What is the? Is there a special like URL Berg.com? What, what is yeah. that? <laughs> it's a uh, Berg.com, B-U-R-G.com slash. T G G, as in the Go Giver. So Got it. BRG.com slash T G G. You can also find it on that home page, but it's, it could be easier just to go right to the uh, to the link. Yeah, I love watching those. Um, my final question is: What's one thing you, know, you left us with? A lot of great information, things we can do, and things we should think about. What's one thing people should remember in general in order to be successful? Well, I, yeah, I think one thing is we just never stop learning. Just keep learning, and there's so much great information out there. You know, whether it's those classic books, whether it's the Think, the Think and Grow Riches, or the, you know, books like from 1900, Orison Sweat Martin, Peace, Power, and Plenty. One of my favorite books of all time. He's the founder of Success Magazine. He wrote that book in 1900. You know, books like Ben Franklin's Autobiography, in which we can learn so much, and studying people like Booker T. Washington, and, you know, there's just so much out there, so much great information. Um, I think it's also a matter of really, you know, just like in Think and Grow Rich when they talk about your definitive purpose, it's it's really coming up with that, and you alluded to this earlier, when really deciding your purpose, defining, defining why you're here, deciding why you're here, and what that, that big desire is, and, and something that really keeps you, wow, just so excited about life and so wanting to do that. Then I think there's really a three-step formula once you know what it is you want to do. I think it's first... Uh, seek out and find the information. If you want to do it, someone already has. They put it in book form or CD form or, or somehow. Okay, so in other words, find the system. What is a system? I define a system as simply the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles. So don't try and reinvent the wheel. Find the wheel and the map, you know, the instructions for it and do it that way. Next is take information, you know, apply the information immediately. Uh, don't wait till you're perfect, uh, because that's not going to happen. Just apply the information and you're going to improve as you do it. Three is be persistent. Outlast the nose. Yeah. You know, my, my friends Andrea Waltz and Richard Fenton, they have a book, a little small little book called Go for No. And you can find it at www.gofornow.com. And it teaches you not just how to accept the nose, but how to embrace the nose. Their mantra is, yes is the destination, no is how you get there. But when you know that no's are natural, see, I think that people get discouraged because they think they're the only one that's getting told no or getting knocked down. Yeah. When we realize it's part of the process, we're fine with it. And then the other thing is just have such belief in what you're doing that you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And that keeps you able to keep going after that. That, that desire. On the persistence note, and I remember when I was um, watching all the videos um, of, of you that I found, and could you tell a story, you, about the publishing, when you were trying to get it published? Because you went through a lot of persistence and resistance with that. Well, yeah, with, with uh, The Goat Giver, I think we, uh, in our, our agent, we worked with a wonderful, wonderful agent, the McBride Literary Agency, and uh, we went through, I think, 25 or 26 rejections, and Margaret was great, though, uh, our, our agent, because she had really terrific information on how to sort of upgrade the proposal, and, and you know, she had me create a video that kind of said... Uh, and so it was a matter of, of 
taking the objection and not feeling defensive about it, although there's that inclination to do that too, because why don't they want this book, right? But, but then making the adjustments and going after it. But sometimes you've got to realize too that what you've got is correct. You just need to find the right person. Well, we ended up finding a publisher, and I've worked with many, many publishers because I've had a bunch of books out, and all my publishers have been great, great people. These people, though, are just the best. I have never, the Penguin, port, the portfolio division of Penguin, the most supportive, amazing publishing house I've ever had the, the pleasure to work with. So all those rejections, what did they do? They they helped us find the people who were the right ones to publish the book and, and right. helped immensely in the book's success. Yeah, I mean, it's a good way of looking at it because a lot of people out there may be getting discouraged and it's not as easy as it looks. It takes a lot of hard work and persistence. So well, remember, you know, Mark Victor Hansen and Jack Canfield, didn't they go through hundreds of rejections or something for Chicken Soup for the Soul and it sold, what, close to a half a billion copies now. I so, remember hearing that. Well, every, Bob, I just want to be the first one to thank you for joining us. I know you have a million things going on, so thanks for taking the time. And everyone should check out um, Berg.com. And thank you so much, Bob. Oh, thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate you greatly. Thanks for having me with you.